I read Mass Effect Annihilation and I enjoyed it quite a bit. It takes the Mass Effect series and does so many incredible things with it. It adds so much lore, expanding on themes present in all the games and uses the setting wonderfully. And the characters are, like in the games, the best part of it. And I wanted to talk about it. But before talking about the actual book, I want to talk about the meta discussion surrounding it. When anyone talks or thinks about the book, they inevitably say it was supposed to be a DLC for Andromeda but it was turned into a book due to the poor reception of the game. Now, that isn't true. The Andromeda books start their development sometime in 2016. Now that tells us that the books were being made alongside the game. So Annihilation couldn't have been a DLC for Andromeda because it was being made alongside the game. And nothing changed in Annihilation, according to the author, it was the same since day one. So this book was a DLC made into a book, it was always meant to be a book. Now that doesn't mean there wasn't any plans for the Quarian Arc DLC, just that the book wasn't originally DLC. It is possible that there was a DLC for the Korean arc, especially since the book got a six month delay, but that could be attributed to the wanting to make the book really good, but was scrapped due to the reception of the, uh, uh, reception of the game. It is also possible that the book was going to set up for DLC, but that is just speculation. On to the book now. What I like a lot about the book is how well it represents the lore of the universe and how well it expands upon it. For example, at the start of the story, the Koreans are building their arc at Hephaestus Station, in the Calcyon Rift within the Attican Traverse. What makes this such a cool detail is that it understands the politics of the Milky Way and thus shows that while the initiative is trying to give every race a new chance, like letting the Krogan come along, it, is, it still can't escape the reality of how the Koreans are treated. The council doesn't trust the Koreans after what they did with the Geth, so they won't uh, allow them to build such a massive ship in council space, despite uh, what it is for, which makes a lot of sense. The council would be reasonable in suspecting the, that in the initiative building 1.5 kilometer sh ships bigger than all human dreadnoughts is uh, for something nefarious. They can say it is for intergalactic travel, but every attempt to do so has failed. So from their perspective, it is more likely some foul, uh, something foul is at play, which is why the Orcs aren't outfitted with weapons or have fighters inside them. And if they didn't allow the human, Asari, Turian, and Salarian Orcs to have weapons, then they wouldn't really allow the Koreans to build their Ark in Council Space due to them creating the Geth. Now just to clarify, Koreans don't have weapons on the Kila Silai either, for the simple reason that they are in the Ashkin Diverse, not a safe place to build a massive warship or ship, because of how unstable it is, with so many, uh, with many pirates uh, who wouldn't really care about the distinction between the initiative and the council. The Koreans built it there simply because it was either there or nowhere. The only other place they could build is in the Terminus systems, but Arya would uh, make the initiative pay a steep price for protection and require full access to what they're doing, which can't be done, you know, because of the whole AI and benefactor thing. Another example is how the Korean Ark is run. The Ark isn't just for Koreans, despite the name. It is for any race that can buy or barter their way onto the ship. Because uh, the Koreans don't have enough people to fill all 20,000 slots, so the Kila Slei comprises of 4,000 Koreans, 4,564 Drell, 3,311 Elcor, 3,000 Volus, a few hundred Batarians and 50 Hanar, which is, if you do the math, doesn't amount to 20,000. I will be generous and interpret a few hundred as 300 for the Batarians, totaling to 15,225 people. This is this isn't particularly relevant uh, and you can interpret what a few means, but I thought it was pretty interesting to know. Since the Ark isn't just for Koreans, it means that the Korean Ark has to accommodate uh, for each race's particular needs. The Korean section is fully sterile, the Elcor section has higher gravity, and the Vola section has a saturated ammonia environment. It also has a quorum, where all the races are represented. This is to ensure that every race has a say in how the ship's functions. One of the first decisions made by the Quarium was banning the pets. Now, another interesting thing is that there are three pathfinders representing two of each race. The uh, Quarians uh, pathfinder Tilem Yerard, a uh, Yered, represents uh, the Quarians and Petarians. Quick mention, I, am, I get conflicting information on whether uh, they are a man or a woman. It is weird, I don't remember the book mentioning their gender, yet I see a lot of people talking about them as a woman. Additionally, they and Captain uh, Captain of the Kila Salai, uh, Ketsi Oklam, are lovers. 
As for the other two, I I have no idea. I don't remember what the book says, and I can't find it online. If you have information on it, please do share. But on the Pathfind, back on the Pathfinder topic, since this is a Corian ship, the AI Sam is shackled and limited from achieving intelligence, which makes a lot of sense. The book does a great job in showing how the Ark is designed, with every race in mind. It makes sense that most Corians wouldn't go on this trip because they want ran out back, not another world, and the characters reflect that. First officer Senenir Vaskila Salai and Captain Ketsi Olam Vaskila Siai are both a part of the Nidus movement. Their motto being Mir Mirava Ranok, meaning forget Ranok. They wanted to have a home and to finally be able to rebuild instead of hoping one day Rannoch will be theirs. And this is pretty cool. Only these kind of Koreans would even think of leaving the galaxy. To get away from it all and start fresh. In a galaxy that hopefully treats them as equals. There, There is uh, more to these two characters but I will get to that later. But uh, what I want to talk about is the Koreans' ancestor VI. In the games uh, we hear a lot about them but all we really get is it exists and they are pretty advanced. Maybe getting too advanced, but not a lot of details were shared on how they operated, which is why the book comes in and fills the details in quite beautifully. Senna has an ancestor VI called Liat Nir. Liat is also Senna's grandmother, many times removed. Her current age is 959 years at the time they wake up in uh, transit between the galaxies. She was a brilliant programmer and the best guess neural designer to have ever lived. The VI uh, was made at the height of the Korean's ancestor VI technology. So we know that uh, what we see in the book represents uh, how, how good ancestor VIs could be. What this means is if you talk uh, to Liat without being told she is a VI, you would think uh, you are talking to an AI imprint of Liat Nir. Liat herself is described as a loving but harsh old grandma, and this is quite amazing to read. Seeing all the creative insults she uses at Senna and all the little quirks of an ancestor VI has just really adds to, you know, the ancestor VIs into the world and to the story. When you ask an ancestor VI, they will begin the process to answer the question. And instead of just standing there, they will start a loading animation. These animations range from simple to weird. She could be drawn in the sands of Rannoch or washing clothes in a river. Senna's favorite is when she's smoking, which I think is pretty cool. The details of how an ancestor VI works is extensive, which is another reason I like the book. The amount of details it puts in is astonishing. It really makes the book feel like a love letter to the series. I would recommend you actually read it or listen to the book because I won't be able to describe it too well. But the basic gist is it uses genetic programming which allows it to adapt as to give the best and closest answer the real person if they were in the situation could give. If it is a completely new problem, it can randomize all the knowledge it has to give a new answer. It works most of the time, and whatever answer it gives, it remembers so it can be used again. But for it to give the best answer, you must give it a lot of information, otherwise it will give basic answers like turn it off and on again, which happened to Senna, but that might just be Liat being Liat. The only issue with an ancestor VI, VI's answer is that it would be either confusing or a roundabout way of answering the question due to the fact that genetic programming can make it confusing. When Senna asked if uh, he will ever see Rannoch someday, she replied with go fish. He doesn't really understand what it, that means, but what I think it means is that Senna has to go find it, to look for it. He won't be destined to, to see, uh, he will have to do it himself, though he can get a straightforward answer from her if he just asks. But he didn't know that, which is pretty funny. Also, fun fact, Liot is the name of Senna's actual grandmother who came aboard. The reason I mention this is that the first time Senna mentions Liot, it's supposed to be a bit confusing because when he refers to Liot again, it's like, wait, he's going to talk to his grandmother? But no, he's actually meaning, you know, his ancestor VI. I think that's pretty cool. Also, Liat is depicted uh, without a suit, so we actually get a description of how they look before the Mass Effect Legendary Edition launched. It describes her having graying uh, hair, bird-like legs, and white pupilless eyes. The eyes uh, having no pupils could be because she's old, but the book doesn't really explicitly say this. Now, I will say this again, the description does come before the Legendary Edition came out, and so this is what a second look at the Koreans uh, uh, are, is. If we look at the first uh, tally face reveal, we see some similarities, but the book left out the human details, uh, you know. Now that uh, could just be me hoping for a more alien version of the Koreans, but this description at least tries to emphasize uh, the more alien look of the Koreans, which I appreciate. 
The Drell want a new homeworld, and to break their reliance on the Hanar. While most Drell are on the sea I still respect the Hanar for what they did, they still want their people to be their own, and going on the Ark is the best way for them to do that. They don't have the economic or political power to find and colonize a new planet in the Milky Way, so they join because the initiative will provide that, and uh, every Drell character we meet is uh, excited by this idea, which uh, makes the fact that the Drell outnumber the other races even more interesting. We also get some great uh, Drell lore in Annex Therian. She was part of the compact, uh, and it is implied that her relationship wasn't beneficial as others, giving us a bit uh, of a darker side to the compact. So we also get some interesting responses about Keprel's syndrome. In the story, there is a disease going around, but so far it's only killed Drell. So the Sleepwalker team theorized it could be Keprel's syndrome. Annex's response is pretty interesting as she says that if it was just Keprel's syndrome, they just talk chalk it up to bad luck and move on with their life. Because they there is nothing they can do about it but to feel sorry for the Drell. It's quite interesting. Honestly, I don't know why the Elcor joined. Uh, the book doesn't really give a reason why they might, unless I forgot. The only thing I can say is that, like most of the races on the Ark, they aren't normal. But uh, uh, the only main character, uh, Elcor character we get, is a Shakespeare superfan, Yorick, which the book uh, leans heavily into. The series of joke uh, the games make about Elcor's like in Shakespeare is taken seriously. Elcor likes Shakespeare because it speaks to how they act and believe, the prefacing the statement with emotions, to how they speak clearly with no confusion that it's what makes Shakespeare is so enthralling to them. It isn't just a gag joke anymore, it's something far more deeper than to, that is used to describe Elcor culture. And the book also shows us other aspects of Elcor culture. York himself demonstrated so well, and it's honestly one of the best characters in the books. His and Senna's friendship is something I love dearly. He is also written, he's also writing Elcor Macbeth, which is pretty cool. Also, York uh, believes in a Shakespeare theory that says he wasn't a human but rather an Elcor and that Denmark is actually a bastardization version of the Elcor home uh, de Kuna, another cool thing. The Volus joined because they wanted to get in on the potential profits in the new galaxy. They want to become the new Volus elite of Andromeda, and they weren't going to let anyone else do it. The book does a great job in exploring the part of their culture, and other parts as well. The Volus, as in the games, are focused on trade, barter, and economy, to the point where they will trade their own people as well in a pseudo-weird, pseudo-sort of indentured servitude. We also understand that they don't like mindless death. If the death was caused by war, then sure, they can make money that way. But murder or simple death just isn't profitable, which is interesting and fits with our understanding of the Volus. They are a mercantile, uh, they are a mercantile race that wants profit, but we also get a side to them that's not often explored. One of the main characters, Irit Nans, uh, a famous fo Volus fashion designer father, Gavno Yap, is opposed uh, to the idea of Volus mercantilism. He also says the most communist thing ever, all property is theft, all money is blood money. He was a villain of Volus uh, society, inspiring many attacks uh, on, or bombs uh, attacks on many financial institutions or places of power. He is also a fixture of Volus political satires as well, but eventually the Vol Protectorate had enough and exiled him. Which is also interesting because apparently the Vault Protectorate exiled only a few people like once in its entire existence and he was there like twice, which is pretty funny. What I like about Gavno Yop is that he, it shows not every person in a race is the same as their description says. There are people who are out of the ordinary and want to change in the society. Also, Irid Nan is apparently such a good Volus fashion designer and suit maker that many Volus will die happy on her waiting list, just to have a chance at having one of her suits, which is pretty cool. The Batarians are a strange one. There are two kinds of groups uh, who joined. The group uh, who want uh, the Batarians to be more than villains in stories, like Borbala Farong, and the others, uh, other who wants uh, to become the heads of the new caste system, someone like Jalosk Delvira. In the games, uh, we are shown that Batarians are basically just evil. They can do some, they, some of them can do good, but for the most part, they're quite bad. Slavery, drug dealers, uh, smugglers, varen kickers, 
But this book uh, places all that in context. Batarians act like that because the galaxy enables them to do that. They live in an environment which encourages that. Jalak Stolvira, in response to Yorick and Ketsi Olam, saying Batarians are bad, says that if they could make more m profits by selling rainbows, smiles and cuddles, they would do that. The fact that other people buying slaves uh, and uh, red sand says more about them than Batarians, which is such a cool thing to do. Batarians are a product of their environment. Their whole society has been made has made them into what they are. I always took issue with how Mass Effect portrayed the Batarians as inherently bad. It implies that the solution to stop the Batarians from doing crime isn't to make crime unviable, but to kill them. The book does a great job saying that it is in their environment and not the people themselves. Now this doesn't mean the Batarians are innocent, just that they're a race that isn't genetically evil. Another humanizing moment is when Jalask talks about his kids. It's sort of weird, like him saying they should have ten, they, they they should give him ten to fifteen percent of their future profits because he helped create them. But it takes a turn with him saying he has given them unconditional love, affection, and undying loyalty. He then shares stories of him helping them when they hurt when they hurt themselves. He also adds that they should stay nearby where he is. He loves his kids and wants them to be with him. Now, uh, what he said about future prophets is so bad, but it is clear that he cares about them a lot. Yorick and uh, Ketsi are surprised by this, and Jalasik replies saying, no race can evolve without love for their children. Such a great, a good moment, uh, not just for Jalasik, but also what it means for the Batarians. Borbala Faronk is an infamous aristocrat of the Faronk crime family. She was so good, she earned the titles Queen of Smugglers and Knife in the Dark. She killed many of her own family members for trying to kill her or cheating her out. She is the embodiment of what people think Batarians are. But what got her nearly killed was because she left the family business to start uh, a Batarian renaissance. She is an avid painter and sees the value of having culture that is more than just black market dealings. She is still a bad person, but she wants it to be more than that. For this, for, her four sons gouged one of her eyes out and then sold her off for cheap. This story does so much to show how the Batarians work, but also the desire to be more. She also has 17 kids. It's not really important, but I thought it was interesting. Also, she comes, uh, she calls a Korean homeless, which is pretty funny to be honest. The Hanar on the Kila Slayer are all death cultists, only slightly exaggerating. Which makes sense. Most Hanar don't want to leave the Milky Way because the Inkindlers live there, and leaving the galaxy would be leaving the Inkindlers' work, so the only Hanar who would join would probably be the ones who are death cultists. But the rationale is quite interesting. What they believe is the Inkindlers themselves believed uplifting life was a mistake, as all life seems to trend towards destruction of others and themselves. Therefore, the best action to take is to do nothing and wait for the Inkindlers to come on the day of extinguishment, which is where they destroy all life and cleanse the galaxy. This is obviously was an issue for the Hanar government, which led the cult leader Kolia to leave uh, the, with the initiative, so they can spread their belief in peace, meaning their end goal is to convince as many people as possible to just stop and do nothing. But we do get some interesting lore. Han, another Hanar he sees, is freaked out when Yorick tells him his real name. Yorick changed his name because he felt Yorick wasn't, was more true to him. Yissis gets freaked out because giving a soul name is so so haphazardly is just nothing that you know the Hanar like. Also, they have little jetpacks to float around. That's pretty cool. This book does an incredible job at weaving the characters' story and lore and their reasons into the story. Every race and character are so real and tied to the world of Mass Effect. The last thing I want to mention is the story. Now, I do recommend you actually listen or read the book itself as it is basically a detective story and details are very important in detective stories, but I'll try to cover the more important bits. Right before the arc launched, there were a few last minute installations. A code cleaner, Oliver Barnes, is contract contracted to install a lullaby called My Suit and Me for a lot of credits. He had a friend who also got a lot of credits for installing Urshart scented canisters for drill pods. Urshart being a flower native to Rakana, it smells really nice. Oliver, before installing the lullaby, checks the code to see if there is anything wrong with it. After he finds there's nothing bad with it, he installs it, thinking it's just a cute gesture for when the colonists wake up. After he, the credits come into his account, he is killed right after that. 
The prologue does a great job establishing its mystery. We know the lullaby must be a computer virus and the canisters must be deadly somehow, but then the questions of who would do this begins to crop up. Who would want to harm the Ark? And specifically, who would want to harm the Drell? Then the next uh, question is why did they do this? Do they hate the Andromeda Initiative or just the Drell? Already we are asking questions and hypothesizing out some answers, but still left with more questions. 567 years later, 2753 CE, the book opens up uh, uh, the with the Ark still in transit. The Ark's VI, K, wakes up three members of Sleepwalker Team Blue 7. The team leader, Senanir Vaskiras Lai, medical specialist Yorick, and systems analyst Annex Therian. Just a quick note, Annex is pretty much a Drell detective. The book describes and uses her like that, which is pretty cool because Drell having a beyond perfect memory uh, would make them really good detectives. Kay tells them that 10.1% of the Drell have died in the pods. 10.1% of 4,564. Drell is 4,103, rounded up, meaning 461 Drell died. But then Kay is asked if there are any if any of them are dead, and he just simply replies, all life signs are stable. The only reason he knew that they were dead was because of the chemical imbalance on a large scale. Arriving in the Drell pod zone, they plan to take the body of Sovel Araxios, a member of Sleepwalker Team Yellow 9, and examine the body. Just before that, Kay informs the team that 10 more Drell died and one Hanar. Senna then authorizes Kay to wake up the rest of Blue 7. Already our prior questions get answered, but still leaves questions. The lullaby is a virus and the canister contains, contains the virus as well. The virus targets more than Drell, meaning whoever did this and why they did this is potentially targeting everyone off or those uh, who don't have suits. The rest of the team revives hydraulic uh, chemical specialist Yeezys, specialist Bobala Farang, and specialist Irid Nan. They all meet at the radial, a meeting point where each race has their own little environmental zone to discuss uh, what is happening. By the time, 461 Drell and 2 Hanar have been visually confirmed dead. But it's more likely that 471 Drell died, it's just that they haven't confirmed all of the deaths. When the team arrives, they all discuss and argue what is happening. They all come to the conclusion that this isn't poison, disease, equipment malfunction, sabotage, or an accident. All the events uh, that happened so far don't really fit either any of those ideas. This had to be something deliberate. Yissies argue that they should wake up the Pathfinders to solve the problem. They could figure out what is going on faster than they could. But Senna doesn't want to do that because whatever is infecting the ship could infect the Pathfinders. Especially considering the Ark Sams is a lot weaker than the other Sams. But while they continue to argue, two Drell and a Hanar die. 473 Drell and three Hanar are dead. Senna then splits up the team into three groups. Team what with Yorick and Yissies to figure out what is causing the deaths, Team Who with Annex and Borbala to figure out who is behind this, Team How with Senna and Irrit to figure out how this is happening by fixing any hardware or software issues. Bear in mind I am going to, and I already have, skipped a lot of details. At this point in the story the Ark is conserving power, therefore the medbay isn't online, and it doesn't have all the needed equipment because this, uh, because this scenario wasn't supposed to happen, meaning at uh, the start team who is finding medical equipment for team what but i am going to skip a lot of this which is a shame because a lot of the details and character moments are really good and do a great job at setup also i skipped the part where there was a junk york uh, york and also at some point uh, barbala will shout homeless to a Korean. Team Watt, with their scavenged medical equipment, finds out of it's a Volus disease called Yoktan, uh, which has been causing the Drell and, ha and Hanar to die. Yoktan is a highly contagious pathogen, being the equivalent to human chicken box. But since it jumped species, it means it's far more dangerous now. Yorick then enacts quarantine protocols. Team Who went to, uh, to go through the security footage of the Ark to see if there was anyone who was awake besides the Sleepwalker team. Note this process did take a long time, about 7 hours. Hours. They found a shadow being casted in the blind spot of uh, cameras starting 150 years after the launch. Team Howe tried to fix what was going on but found no success. There was no bugs, glitches or hardware issues. Everything appeared to be safe and functional. They also trimmed, uh, uh, tried to turn on the power for Team What, but instead caused temperature and temperature controls and lights to go haywire. 
I like this a lot because it makes so much sense to do this and it enhances the mystery. Each team investigating what is going on reveals something. Team what revealed uh, what was killing them, but a question now remains on how did it jump species. Team who revealed that there was something on the Ark trying to hide, but they still need to know who it is. When they were arguing, they discussed it that if this wasn't intentional, then the person behind it would try to ensure that their plan was successful. Throughout the centuries, meaning the, this person had to try to uh, be tired because of the constant thorn and freezing, or they were a Krogan and a Sari who could live through the journey. Team Howe revealed that whatever it is infecting the system, it is highly dangerous. By the time that they all meet again, 34 Drell and 6 Hanar died, totaling 507 Drell and 9 Hanar, leaving 4057 Drell and 41 Hanar alive. Without uh, many options left, uh, Senna tells Kay to wake up the captain, Ketsi Olam, Vaskila Salai, and then uh, has Irit uh, make uh, Annex uh, environmental suit as she is vulnerable to the virus. But before they could do that, this uh, sick battalion approaches them, Jalask Delvira, who is a part of Seabalker Team Yellow Nine, who is infected. He gets isolated and targeted by Annex, who doesn't he doesn't really know anything or doesn't know what is happening. All he knows is that he feels a lot in pain. But he does give something, a name that might help. Annex. Malak Rafa Vaskila Salai, another member of Sleepwalker Team Yellow Nine. Then she tells the Senate to wake him up so he can go question him. I mention this because this is a very interesting interaction between Irrit and Barbala and Jalosk. Irrit is frustrated that the virus is Volus in origin, thus sees this as a chance to shift blame to the Batarians, saying like, oh, Batarian just popped up, which means it must be the Batarians, right? Apparently a lot of Volus feel discriminated as they feel they are targeted a lot, which is interesting. How justified they feel is another matter, but it is interesting. The two Batarians have a hostile relationship as Jalosk thinks Barbala betrayed the Batarian way. He doesn't say this outright, but later on it was implied and inf and it informed his actions. Kitsi shortly arrives and is caught up to speed. Another thing uh, goes wrong as the ship's shields start flickering, causing space debris to hit the ship. And then after that the team spits up again and uh, try to get to the bottom of this. Senna though goes back to his quarters and activates his ancestor VI, Liat Nir. After feeding her information about the current situation on the Ark and a lengthy discussion with many simple answers, like turn it off and on, Liat has an idea on what it is, but he needs to know what will break next. That being comms, environment, controls, trams, or cryopods. What I like a lot about this is just the amount of new and expanded lore we get. I do recommend you actually reading or listening to the book, but uh, what I also like is how well the book shows you just how advanced they are. This isn't a Nivea, it is something else entirely. If you have no idea Liata was a VI, you would think she is an AI. Ketsi barges in on Senna and he just uh, turned off uh, Liat in time before she saw her. The, she talks to him and about how she feels terrible about the situation. After this discussion, the death counter stops and Kay informs Senna that 1,637 colonists are awake and in the uh, cargo bay. Trying to contact the rest of the team, they find out that the comms are down. After that, the trams went down. Liata, though still connected with Senna, gives him a patch to, for the trams to work. Senna and Ketsi split up, uh, split up. Senna is going into the cargo bay while Ketsi is going to the medical bay. Ketsi comes back as Yorick was talking to Jalosk to find about uh, how to stop the disease. Yorick tells her everything he knows about the Fortin Brass Plague, named uh, after a character in Hamlet. Yorick is a super fan of Shakespeare. The plague is actually a collection of different diseases from all species, and that everyone on the Ark and the Nexus will be infected. What this tells us is that the plague was made by someone to kill everyone, not an accident or targeting just a few races. York is tired and starts to drift off uh, and eventually starts sleeping. At this point in the story, Blue Seven have been awake for less than two days. They are tired, exhausted, and hungry. This is uh, why York sleeps. But as uh, he sleeps, he sees, gets up and walks outside, believing that today is the ex day of extinguishment and begins to celebrate. Annex Borbala find, proceeds to find Malik and interrogate him. After their discussion, he says nothing happened. Yeah, Annex can tell that he is lying, but, uh, but doesn't say anything. Senna calls them 
so that he to tell them how he can get rid of the computer virus but first he needs uh, as many untainted vi's as possible it doesn't say how it can help him, but it, it will but we do know that it'll increase the processing power of Liat. Once they left, Sana opens up Liat and she tells him what uh, uh, she found. Now, in the story, we don't get uh, to know what she told him until much later, but just for the sake of, you know, me telling you the story, I'm just gonna say what she said to him right now. The virus is a computer worm that is hiding the plague from the ship. If someone is infected, the computer worm tells the system that nothing is wrong. But if an infected person moves, uh, then the computer worm keeps track of them. So, if the person, uh, infected person moves somewhere where the plague can, t uh, can be detected, it'll do a force takeover of that system to send an all clear. Which means any damage that is caused uh, by the worm or anything else will not be picked up by the system because it'll just uh, do an all clear. Any any inbuilt protocols or repairs uh, will not function, and Liat has a solution. Skipping ahead a bit, as I said before, in order to stop the computer worm, she has to integrate herself into the ship to implement her the solution. But by doing that, it'll destroy any personality she has, as the ship will subluminate to her into the system. Senna, with a heavy heart, starts to prepare her integration into the ship. Meanwhile, Yorick finds a way to make a cure, but needs Element Zero, a gene viral lab, and an immune patient. Annex and Bobala will try to find all of that. Senna tells Ketsi of his plan, and she is furious. She doesn't think it is a good idea to trust uh, Liat, as she believes it as dangerous as an AI. She goes to turn it off, but uh, before she can, Senna transferred Liat into the system, where she starts to restore the Arct, so starting with the comms. When the comms are restored, Yorick uses it to say Ketsi is immune. To quickly explain how they found this out, she is immune even though she never really took uh, her suit off uh, before or after entering Cryo, is that because all the Quarians uh, put, kept their suits on while still in Cryo, they all suffered micro-tears in Cryo. These tears were big enough for the virus to slip in. This caused uh, quite a few Quarians to die. So since uh, Ketsi has been awake longer than the colonists and been in contact with the, uh, the plague, they find out that Ketsi is actually immune to the plague. They all head back to the med bay where their retrovirus can be made. Typically, uh, tragically though, Yorick is in the late stages of Fortin Bros. The retrovirus will still be made, but is unsure if he will make it uh, in time, or if it is too late for the retrovirus to be of any help. Skipping around again, when Yorick started uh, showing the symptoms of late of late stage Fortin Bros, he asked Senna to quote him Hamlet's eulogy. Senna refused to do so, saying he will make it in time. Annex calls Ketsi and Sunny Senna to follow her as she may be found uh, found out who released the plague. The Hanar seem to be responsible. When Yi sees his questions, he makes no apology for spreading the plague, believing that uh, the day of extinguishment had come and that all he was doing was celebrating it. Ketsi, ha happily happy to know who finally did it, goes to wake up the quorum. But Annex isn't done yet and invites Senna to see where Ketsi is actually going. Annex and Senna see that Ketsi is meeting with Malik. They discuss that they are safe as they blame has been put onto the Hanar and that they can still proceed with their plans with only minor delay and that Ketsi will kill Yassiz before he can say anything to muddy the waters. With their conversation over, Malik leaves and Ketsi gets comfortable, uh, gets confronted by Senna and Annex. Annex then tells her how, why she knows she was responsible beyond her earlier conversation. She noticed that uh, uh, she and Sovel dancing uh, before the Ark uh, and noticed something suspicious with them. She also saw her kill Oliver on the station, Ketsi being found out, explained uh, her plan. She made Fortin Bros as a depopulation plague, as she believed that the major races human, sorry, Turian, Salarian will still be in charge and not change the galaxy to help the minor races. If the major races are thinned out then, the minor races can have a chance to be in charge for once, preferably with the Quarians at the head. She also says she never meant to th for the plague to kill all the major races, just that she wanted to target enough people so that they would all die. And also she never meant to target anyone on the Ark, and that the Drell were only meant to be carrying the plague. She explains that she's in, uh, uh, she infected the most searchable Drell so that they would spread it far and wide. She explains the reason the plague started to kill everyone was because of Malak. 
Malika made the computer worm to keep the plague hidden, but he screwed up the cryo temperature thresholds for it to follow, which meant the plague has been mutating to become deadlier and deadlier for a long, t a long time. The reason she did this uh, was because of one event. When she was on her pilgrimage, she was uh, pranked by some Salarians. This prank being slipping off her suit and leaving her outside. This nearly killed her and she spent months recovering. This experience has led her to have a hate for the major races and hoping that she could do about it, uh, do something about it one day. She pleased to send an annex uh, to say nothing because if any of the other races found out about this, they, they would suffer as a result. Senna uh, thinking over this uh, decided that there will be enough to judge her. What they decide on uh, this was pretty biblical, uh, where she will be injected with the cure and then forced to walk throughout the ship without her suit and to and ensure everyone gets it. She will have to walk from environmental zone to environmental zone and make sure everyone gets the cure. How this will work is that everyone will need to have direct contact with her to receive it. Now, I think a lot of people, myself included, may read this and wonder, how will this cure be spread by injecting her and letting other people touch her? And honestly, I don't know. I'm unsure why this uh, would work uh, because the only way I can make sense of this is that the cure will secrete from her skin and then touching it will pass the cure from her skin to their skin, then to their body. But honestly, I don't know and I don't really think this is a big deal uh, as the scene is well done and the punishment is just so deserving. But before this can uh, happen, Yorick finally succumbs to the plague. The way that the book writes this scene is just so beautiful. From the way he falls uh, to how Senna cries for it not to be true, Yorick begs Senna to give him his uh, request. Senna with a heavy heart and knowing his friend's time has come, quotes Hamlet's eulogy. Now cracks a noble heart, good night sweet prince, and flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. Yorick happy to have been given his request dies shortly after. I can't do this scene any justice, uh, but I do hope you understand what I'm trying to convey. Once again, I do recommend you actually go through the book and experience this yourself. What happens after is Ketsi uh, walking through the entire ship ensuring everyone gets the cure, until she reaches her final destination in the ammonia-filled area of the Volus, where she finally dies. Where And also they all huddle towards a corpse to get the cure. After that, they start to return the Ark to a proper state. The bodies have been given, have been gathered and injected into space. This also includes Malik. He wasn't infected, it's just simply that they wanted to get rid of him. The book ends off with Annex and Barbala kissing each other and Senna hearing the last remnants of Liot's personality being wiped. They all enter back into Cryo and await their arrival in Andromeda. And that is everything I wanted to talk about with Annihilation, or at least everything I felt that uh, showed why I liked this so much. I did gloss over a lot of stuff from lore, characters and backstories, because I wanted to be concise, as if I did get some things wrong, I do apologize. I didn't want to bog this down and I can't, and also can't remember everything. So if I did get anything wrong, please do mention it. Once again, I highly recommend you actually listen, uh, read or listen to the book yourself. And if you listen to it, you'll hear Tom Taylorson, male writer, voice in the book. And he does an excellent uh, uh, and amazing job at it. He is honestly on par with the voice acting talents of both Commander Shepherds, especially with Mark Mears' uh, alien voice voices. Please uh, uh, go give him some love on his Twitter. And a huge thanks and love to the amazing uh, uh, author of the book, Catherine M. Valenti. She is clearly a huge mass fan and loves the series. Please go to her Twitter and check out her Q&A that she did quite a while ago. It is full of some wonderful insight into the book and like the fact that she was gonna reveal what the photos looked like but and took some Greek inspiration for the Hanar. And yeah, I hoped you enjoyed watching this.